Thanks, Lahana. Thanks, Claire. Hello, everyone. Um, as Claire's mentioned, I'm Fahana, I'm the site lead at Kent, and I'm going to talk about how to put together a fundable grant proposal. Right, I hope you all can see that. Okay, so I think one of the critical messages are is that, you know, why should your topic matter? You know, why, what, how can you convince the funding panel that it is a clinical problem that needs to be, you know, that needs to be researched. Um, and so you really need to get some inspiration behind that idea. Is it a new drug therapy addressing, you know, that you believe is better than standard treatment and would be more effective um, for treating patients? Um, it may well be a way of organizing and structuring a care pathway that is far better than current practice and how it can actually bring a positive outcome for service users. It might be a public health intervention in a non-NHS setting in communities or schools that will reduce health inequalities, or an issue raised by one of your patients that, that has made you think you need to, you know, really um, go back and rethink how care is provided. And um, there are organisations such as the James Lind Alliance or other organisations that help identify research priorities. So really help, it, it, it helps to get some kind of inspiration and really why that actually matters to um, the patients and why you ought to convince the funding panel to, um, you know, um, award your grant. Is your, is your idea novel? So you really need to it, it explain and not just in scientific terms, but um, in in language that non non specialist audience will understand um, why your idea ought to be funded and why it, why it is novel and addresses a particular knowledge gap. And it's really worth doing your homework and demonstrating to the public that you've to, to the panel that you've done your homework. So check out things like the um, clinical research network portfolio of pre-existing funded studies, the UK Clinical Trials Gateway, and you'll see the links here, the NHS Journals Library. I always like to look at the Cochrane Library when I've, um, when I've been advising on projects to see, you know, what is the current evidence base like? And the next um, critical um, point is to focus on that, you know, it, it may seem very obvious, but that patient benefit, sometimes you see when we, when we support projects, um, the clinical um, academic, the researcher gets quite wrapped up in that novel idea or, you know, wants to see the, um, the change in the clinical pathway, you know, put into practice, um, but somehow loses sight of what that patient benefit might be. And so all funds and panels will want to see that very clearly, explicitly explained in your proposal. In, and it's especially true to case if um, you are applying for public money, you really need to um, demonstrate how you'll be providing value for number, number one, value for money, but also that it will be of use to the NHS or social care. So it's important in that, you know, preliminary um, plain English summary, for instance, to talk about the number of people affected by the condition describe that current pathway and the burden of the condition to um, service users in the local care system and demonstrate how the results of your research will lead to an improvement in um, specific outcomes for those users. And as I said, it, it, it's not always down to having a cheap, quick method of, of saving the NHS money. They are also interested in clinical effectiveness alongside cost effectiveness. So, you know, why is your um, research idea, your topic area, why is it important? Why are you going to make the case for it being a priority? So it's really important to talk to the, the service users and I will have a discussion around a quick sort of slide around patient and public involvement. And Katie and Finley will talk further about that. But you ought to identify who the service users are, what the current pathway is, and where does the, where along it does the problem actually lie? How will your research address the problem? You know, how can you make change as a result of your research? Clearly demonstrating at the same time value for money. How will you, will you disseminate your results? What impact will it have? 
and how fundamentally will it make changes to clinical practice? One of the critical things when we review grant, um, we re um, review applications in draft stage is that you really need to accurately define your research question, make it very simple and clear and specific and something that you can answer. Sometimes we do see quite broad questions and we, we sort of look at the methodology and the research design and might say, well, that um, methodology may, may well not answer that question. Um, so try and be fairly focused. Um, so some examples here, um, can monitoring wound um, pH help identify wounds at risk of becoming chronic? Does mindfulness-based cognitive therapy reduce severity of symptoms of OCD? And I've touched upon this. So once you've identified your research question, is the design you've chosen the appropriate one that will answer that question? So make sure that the design that you choose answers your, pre, your defined research question that you've stated at the beginning. Think about what might the best methodology or mix of methodologies might be. And what type of study is it? Is it an intervention development, a feasibility or a pilot, a longitudinal case study, cohort study, or are you wanting to go for a full randomized controlled trial? And things that you ought to consider when um, devising your design are issues such as generalizability of results, what are the sources of bias, and think about, you know, really try and think ahead what some of the recruitment and retention issues might be and how you might overcome any um, barriers to recruitment and retention. One um, critical um, aspect that the panel will see is who exactly is on your team. Um, they would expect to see expertise in all the areas that are required to address and answer that, that very vital research question. It's important to have a named person for each job. So you would have a principal or a chief investigator who takes overall responsibility, but then you'd also have a named person who might be leading on the health economics or the statistics or the qualitative part of that study. Usually, um, you know, it's somebody who, uh, the principal investigator is usually somebody, a leader in the field, who has a good track record um, and make sure if you are an early career researcher that you have a mentor um, or in some cases, for instance, in research for patient benefit, there is um, the case for a joint um, principal investigator and make sure you've identified the right person there for you. And I'll, I'll come on to that um, in the next slide or so. So you, do you are required to have a whole host or a, a team of um, research experts involved, such as a statistician, a health economist, and so forth. So this is what I've been, I've signposted earlier around early career researchers. So research for patient benefit, which Claire has touched upon um, this morning, encourages applications from early career researchers, and you can have a, a joint lead. So an early career researcher um, these are where applications um, are encouraged to, where applicants are encouraged to apply as the lead with a more senior colleague as mentor and joint lead. And the current guidance does um, provide information on what an early career researcher is, helps applicants to know when to apply and help navigate the application process. And we've got quite a nice story here of Justine Tomlinson, who is a specialist pharmacist and is a doctoral training fellow at Leeds um, Teaching Hospital. Uh, and, you know, why she decided to apply for RFPB. Um, and, it, you know, more often than not, the case is that she has the support of an experienced um, chief investigator who is part of that research team and is a, a joint lead with her. In terms of, you know, what an important focus of your application is the, how the research will be delivered if, effectively through research management. Um, and so they will, the panel will look at the overall team, the principal investigator or the chief investigator and the host of co-applicants. And they will want to gather who has overall responsibility of the project and reports to the funder. It's important 
if you are having, um, depending upon the size of your study, for instance, a full trial might, you might be expected to have, you would be expected to have a steering group, as well as a data monitoring ethics committee, um, as well as, um, you know, which will involve a chair and external members to the group, um, other stakeholders such as service users, charity reps, and that steering group deals with the general oversight of the project data monitoring and any ethical issues. You may well have a separate service user group. It's important to involve a project manager or a, or a trial manager, as well as have the involvement of a clinical trials unit. And I know you've got Nikki talking later on today about that. And a really essential part of a, a, an application is public involvement and I know you have Katie and Funmi who will go into much more detail about that but I just wanted to flag up that that's essential to any part of an NIHR application and those lay reps sit they can sit on funding panels and um, are external reviewers as well for, of your application it's important to highlight pet public involvement throughout the application from the design stage um, that you might need to consult them before you finalise the design and submit it. You know, treat them as experts whose input you are seeking. They can provide really great insight into the research process itself for that patient group, as well as comment and provide signposts and, and um, other uh, information about how best to disseminate the outcomes of that project. And, you know, if anything, it's important to involve a, a, a lay member to review your um, plain English summary. And that it really is the first thing that any reviewer or panel member will read. So it's an ideal place to involve service users as well as the other, in fact, other points to include service users. A critical thing is, of course, the budget. Uh, and, you know, from first, from first principles, you ought to involve your trust R&D department, as well as the Clinical Research Network, Kent, Surrey and Sussex. There is guidance available um, online and we can si signpost you to, to how you put together your costs, how you budget for your um, study, um, which is this accord guidance here. Um, and there is a form called the SOCAP form and some, some that needs to be completed, my understanding with some projects if you get through to stage two, and that needs to be signed off by the Clinical Research Network um, 20 days before submission of your stage two. Essentially, um, what's important for you to note, and it's not complicated, but, in, but essential that, you're, that you get your head around the three types of costs you are expected to put together. You get your research costs, which is the cost of the delivery of the research itself, and those costs end when the project ends you ought to include um, finances for the principal investigator the co-ops the research nurse the trial manager all those costs are linked to the research tasks of of the study itself production of any research materials time to screen potential patients and that's all covered by the funder then you have costs that are NHS treatment costs, which will be usually met by the trust or in the usual commissioning process. And these are um, items such as patient care costs, which will be continued to be um, incurred once the research has ended, the cost of the intervention itself, both the cost of the intervention and the time to deliver it, and the comparator if treatment is usual standard care costs as well. So all those, um, both these um, costs need to be um, within the usual commissioning process covered by the trust itself. And then you have the NHS support costs. And these are usually covered by the Clinical Research Network and we um, can provide you links to how to contact them. And those will be the additional patient costs associated with the research process, which would essentially stop once the research is, has ended and for instance that might be costs that need to be put in the grant for time taken to identify and consent patients so we can signpost you to the relevant um you know sections of the nihr um to for you to get advice with how to put those costs together 
So NIHR um, do now have um, some standard forms and guidance. I ought to um, um, state that those forms and guidance can change. So do make sure that you have the most up-to-date ones. Um, so there is a standard application form you apply online, but um, there are downloadable Word application forms that you can input onto. All NIHR programmes have their own guidance. And as Claire's flagged up, there are 10 programmes, there are 10 um, programmes as well as the fellowships. And so you, you, you need to know which ones, you know, are the relevant ones. Make sure you know the guidance inside out, back to front. Address each section in relation to the guidance that you receive. Do check if it's word count or, or character count. Don't slip up before you, you know, are going to input onto the online form and check the um, numbers of documents that you can append, that you can upload. Is it a Gantt chart? Is it a consult flow chart? A care pathway diagram, a logic model? So do check what you ought to load up with your application as supplementary information. And more critically, where do you get support from? Um, so we can help, and um, we're part of this, this, this diagram, as you can see, but your first port of call is your R&D office at your trust or your equivalent in your local authority or your organization, um, or as it might be your HEI, a research office. Do get in touch with the clinical research network if you have um, support costs. You, you may need to get in touch with local your local clinical trials unit and of course do get in touch with us at the earliest point I would say as, as well as when getting in contact with these respective organisations and we cover the whole of the South East region Kent, Surrey and Sussex. So without further ado if you are if you do have a, a research idea that you would like support from us please do get in touch with us it's a simple online form that you need to submit to us with some fields that you need to um, um, complete. If you get stuck, we're very friendly. Do get in touch with us and we can certainly help with, with getting advice, even with getting on our systems. Um, and if, if anybody has any further questions, I'll be quite happy to take them.